I, I know that we, I mean, every, every time, every year around this time, we uh, put before the congregation uh, not just the needs of our own ministry, but uh, other ministries as well. And this year we're uh, focusing on Haiti because of what happened there. And um, we, we, uh, we challenge you folks a lot. If, you're, if this is your spiritual body, you're probably used to that. Um, but it's because we believe, as I said earlier, that everything in the kingdom goes forward by the people of God bleeding. And uh, this time of year, there's such a, it's just ironic that at the time when we're celebrating the birth of Christ, there's such a pull to go in the, a direction that's absolutely antithetical to what Christ would want. Uh, and, and, and so we're just about saying we should be celebrating his birthday in a way that he would want. And um, that's about not just focusing on our own loved ones. Of course, we love to give presents to our, our loved ones, but uh, to be thinking of others, have a global perspective. It's just, I, it's just rather crazy that a lot of the stress we feel around Christmas, for a lot of us anyways, is, uh, golly, what can I get Uncle Joe? Or, golly, what can I get? And we have to look, you know, struggle to find something to get him. Um, and in the meantime, we've got folks in Haiti who are out on the street and don't have food and don't have uh, clean water and whatever. And so we're not saying neglect your own loved ones, but there ought to be a balancing here, right? And... Um, and so we really pray about how God might lead you uh, in this uh, Haiti endeavor. And uh, another word, note before I get into the word, uh, and that's this. Um, well, this morning I was just reading in the paper uh, some of the stories of the folks who were killed. There's 20 children and um, the adults that were killed there. And I just cried. I just cried. You read some of the stories. Um, and our hearts just go out to them. And, uh, and, and we pray for them. Pray that God will bring comfort in a way that only God can bring comfort. I, it's, uh, I, it's just impossible to imagine what it would be like to be a, a parent or grandparent and have one of your children be among those that were slaughtered. Um, and in, in situations like that, I, I, I don't know, this is the Advent season, right? And uh, last week talked about how um, it's, it's the time of waiting, and I encourage folks to spend 10, 15 minutes a day, uh, just getting in touch with the yearning that is in your heart. Let, let truth arise. And I really am happy with some of the feedback I've gotten about what folks have found out about themselves as they did that. But when I see events like this, when we witness events like this, at the same time, there's 20 kids or 22 kids in China that were stabbed. They didn't die, but they, they were stabbed. Another school was attacked. And when you see stuff like that, it just ought to make your heart yearn all the more for the Lord to return. And to finish what he began with his first coming. This is Advent, and we celebrate the, the, the birth of Christ when he came the first time, but uh, it ain't finished yet, right? Uh, there's there's uh, this in-between time when we have a role to play in carrying out his will and laying the runway strip for him to return. But his promise is that he will return, and he will make the creation right, praise God, and he will eradicate evil. This is not the way the world was supposed to be. It was never supposed to be like this, with these nightmares that go on. Uh, the hope is that, that it won't always be like this, praise God. Uh, he will make all things new, hallelujah. He will restore all things. He will make, he'll make it all more than worth it, incomparably more than worth it. I don't know how, I can't imagine that, but I can trust, praise God. So uh, keep them in our prayers. We are uh, going through this Advent season. We haven't usually made it very much of a big deal about Advent, uh, but we are this year. We thought it's just good to... Uh, Tap into the church tradition. Most streams of Christianity have, have celebrated the four weeks leading up to the birth of Christ, and it's called Advent. And we're using some of the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my favorite theologians, uh, to do this. There's a collection of writings called God is in the Manger, and, we're, and the reflections of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, most of them written while he was in prison uh, in the two years before he was executed. And um, we're using that as a springboard for some of our reflections on this uh, time of year. So I am going to title this message, uh, The Wonder-Filled Life. You've seen the movie, The Wonderful Life. Well, this is The, the Wonder-Filled Life, and you'll see what I'm talking about here uh, in a moment. And I want to uh, start not with a writing of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I'll get to that in a moment, but I want to start with the Apostle Paul and something he says in, of course, the book of Colossians. <laughs> when I'm addicted to something, I'm addicted to the book of Colossians. I got to preach out of Colossians. So here's what he says. Listen to this. It's very interesting. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. 
so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. The full riches of complete understanding. Why? In order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul wants us to have the full riches of complete understanding so that we could know a mystery. Know the mystery as a mystery. Not explain away the mystery, but know the mystery as a mystery. It's an interesting use of the word understanding. Pray with me here as we get into this message. Abba, Father, I thank you, God, for the joy that has been here. Uh, I got, and, and I, I thank you for every person in this auditorium, and those who are listening through podcast or any other means. And I, God, I pray a blessing on them. And I pray, Lord, that you open up each of our hearts and minds right here and right now. Uh, help us to attend to this message, to be present here in this message. Whatever our parishioners are doing, God, I pray that they, they would have their focus on this because it's an important word. And uh, Lord, draw us in to be present here. And Lord, infuse this message with your authority. My words alone have no life. So we look to you, the author of life, and ask that you come now, invade these words Open our hearts and minds to receive them deeply and to be changed by them, fundamentally changed by the mindset with which we live our life. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. It's odd that, that Paul is here hoping that we will get the full riches of complete understanding. Oh, yes, I always forget this. I'm going to try to have time, the operative word there is try, to have time at the end of the message for some questions. This isn't really the kind of... Uh, uh, message where it, it's, it causes a lot of questions, I don't think, but, but uh, in the previous two services there have been some. So if you get a question as I'm going through this message, uh, text it into that number and uh, we'll try to get to them at the end of uh, this message. So Paul says he wants us to have the full, complete riches of, of, uh, of, of complete understanding so that we may know the mystery of Christ. And it's odd because usually we try to get an understanding to get rid of a mystery. We understand something to the extent that it's no longer a mystery. When I say, honey, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm saying, honey, can you take away the mystery? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not getting her. She says it to me. We're looking for uh, something to remove the mystery so we, we, we can get an understanding. But here Paul is not praying that we would get rid of the mystery. No, he wants us to know the mystery. And when we have complete understanding, well, then we'll have a more profound appreciation for the mystery, the mystery which is embodied in Christ. The more we know God in, in the revelation as he's revealed in Christ, the more we understand Christ, the more we see the mystery, the beauty of the mystery, the wonder of the mystery. And so we might call our usual way of understanding things that tries to get rid of mystery, we might call that practical understanding. And this kind of understanding, which appreciates mystery, doesn't explain it away, but the more you understand, the more mysterious it is, we might call that wonder-filled understanding. You see the wonder of it. To know Christ, the more you know Christ, the more wonderful he is. The, the, the more you appreciate how much you don't know, you can't fathom the love. We can't understand the depth uh, of his love. And the reverse is also true. If, if Christ and the Christ story, the revelation of God becoming a human being, born in a manger, if that doesn't fill us with wonder, to that degree we don't understand it. We're missing something. Now here's what's ironic, is that it's Christmas time, and, and, and so we're talking about the most wonder-filled thing ever. We're talking about God becoming a human being. Um, we're talking about the expression of unfathomable love. Christ embodies the mystery of God. And yet, the challenge that uh, I have, and I think most pastors around Christmas time have, is this. It's that, uh, how do you say something about which everyone's already heard, you know, so many times? Something that's so familiar. Uh, several, four or five weeks ago, I sat down with the sermon preparation team that helps me plan my messages. And we were asking the question, what should we preach on in this Christmas season? And we struggle with it because we have to talk about the Christmas story, but everyone's heard it before. How do you have a new angle and have something new to say about something which everyone's already heard? Everyone already knows the story. God became a human being. You already know that. Um, you know, 
Jesus supernaturally conceived of the baby Jesus. You already knew that. Uh, the angel had to warn Joseph, say, don't divorce her. No, this is legit. Uh, the, the angel's saying to the shepherds in the field, the wise men followed the star. Herod tried to kill the child. You already knew all that. So what do I have to tell you? What do I have to say? There's, see, it's, 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 the irony is that it, we're talking about the thing which is most mysterious and wonder-filled and awesome, and yet it's all too familiar to us. And so the question I want to ask is, how do we regain that sense of wonder? So we are awed by this story once again. And it doesn't just apply to the Christmas story. It applies to our life because as you go through life, you get familiar with life. You get used to life. You can get bored with life. All the repetition dulls us to sleep. And you don't have to be 55 for that to happen. That can happen when you're 18. And it's too familiar, and so we stop being awed by life. We stop seeing the wonder of life. And the tragedy is that the the most profound aspect of life, the most beautiful aspect of life, the most godly aspect of life is the wonder of it all, what we don't understand. And so when we lose our sense of wonder, well, we're losing, we're losing really life itself. How do we regain a sense of wonder and awe at the Christmas story and a sense of wonder and awe about our ordinary lives? That's the question. And here I think Bonhoeffer has something profound to teach us. In the second uh, week of Advent, uh, as he's, he divides this up into four weeks in his writings. He doesn't do it, the editor does it, but he says this. Listen to this now. A human life is worth as much as the respect it holds for the mystery. And I don't think he's saying that your worth before God depends on how much you honor the mystery, but he is saying, I think, our, our sense of fullness, our, the richness of our life will totally depend on how we honor the mystery. How in touch we are with what is wonder-filled. Bonhoeffer says, We retain the child in us to the extent that we honor the mystery. Therefore, children open wide-awake eyes. They have open wide-awake eyes because they know that they are surrounded by mystery. They are not finished with this world. I love that phrase, finished with this world. Finished being curious about the world. Finished being awed with the world. They're not finished yet. They still don't know how to struggle along and avoid the mystery as we adults do. And that's something. We destroy the mystery because we sense that here we, are, we reach the boundary of our being. Because we want to be Lord over everything and have it at our disposal. And that's just what we cannot do with the mystery. Then he goes on to say, living without mystery means knowing nothing of the mystery of our own life, nothing of the mystery of another person, nothing of the mystery of the world. It means passing over our own hidden qualities and those of others and the world. It means remaining on the surface, taking the world seriously only to the extent that it can be calculated and exploited, and not going beyond the world of calculation and exploitation. This man is... So insightful and so profound. It's why he's one of my, my favorite all-time theologians. He says, he knows how children have these wide-open eyes. Um, and and they're, they're wonder-filled. The world's still fresh to them. They're not finished with the world. They're not done being curious about the world. No, they're, they're, they're amazed by the world. I think one of the most beautiful things in the world are the eyes of a child when they're looking with wonder. And of course, I'm a grandpa, so I use every excuse I can to show off my grandkids. So here's uh, my grandkids uh, from my one daughter's side, Alicia's side of the family. I wasn't able to get uh, Danae's, but uh, 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 yeah, here they are. Look at the eyes. The eyes are just full of wonder, full of amazement. The the world's still new to them. Um, They're surrounded by mystery because they haven't yet learned the world of of calculation, exploitation, and how just to look at things through practical endeavors. No, they they see things as they are. They're present there. Their minds aren't yet polluted by all sorts of worries and concerns and inhibitions. Uh, They're amazed by things. And so Christmas is so wonderful to have with kids because... They're not used to it yet. They, they don't already know it. So they see the, the presence and there's awe there and they open it and there's such excitement. And when you read the Christmas story to them, well, they haven't already heard it a hundred times. So they're not all familiar with it and bored with it. No, there's an amazement there. You read the Christmas story and you know, God became a baby? Whoa, and, 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 and God was in Mary's tummy? 
and, and, and the angel talked to Joseph, and, and the angel sang to the shepherds in the field, and then the wise men followed the star, you know, and, and the bad Herod tried to get Jesus, and you leave out the part about the slaughtering of the kids. Uh, yeah, there's an amazement there. It's new to them. It's full of wonder. And then Halloween, we take them to this animal farm, and, and it's just so beautiful to watch their eyes full of wonder as they see the goats. They're not, they don't already know everything about goats. The goats are new to them. They're such curious, interesting-looking creatures, and they eat out of your hand. And so Eden is just laughing as the, the, the goat's eating out of their hand, and we touch the horn of a ram, and it has such an interesting texture to it. And there's a little chip uh, off of the, uh, the horn of the, of the ram, and, and, and that leads to a discussion of how did you get chipped? Maybe you got in a fight. You know, with, you got mad at the other rams, but Jesus doesn't want us to fight. And we go into, you know, it's all new, and exciting and the wool of the sheep is so so interesting and the cats are so funny and the cows are so lazy and the pigs make such funny noises and there's wonder there They're, this isn't i already know all of that They're, this isn't over familiar stuff the eyes of a child full of wonder and the question is how can we regain some of that i think part of the reason why we, we envy little children is because we see in their eyes at least the ones that haven't yet been harmed who still have an innocence, we see in their eyes something that we've lost. And we want it back. We can learn so much from watching our kids. Uh, when my grandkids come over, and I'm not going to spend the whole sermon talking about my grandkids. I could, though. But, but you know, the first thing we do most of the time is we go up to Grandpa's room, and, and I, I, I put on some music, and we dance. Uh, and, and for five years, we've been dancing the same song. Uh, <laughs> It's totally inappropriate. Human by the killers. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I just like that song before I know the, the band's name who did it. And, but we sing to it and we dance and they're so free and see they're amazed by what their bodies can do and they show off and they roll on the floor and look what I can do and, and, and they, they haven't yet learned uh, how to be in, in, inhibited and to be, over, to be burdened with concerns and wondering about who's watching. No, there's a freedom that is there and there's so much we can learn. I wonder if this is part what Jesus was getting at when he says, become as little children. Become as little children. And see, they're there. They're present. Their whole being is in the dance. Their whole being is listening to the story. They're not one step removed. How do we regain that? See, we grow up. We become adults. We become practical. We join the rat race. We get involved in the hustle and bustle. And we've seen it all before, right? It's, it's no longer new to us. And so we're kind of finished just being curious and being filled with wonder. And so we, we, we live life one step removed. We live life as a struggle to avoid the mystery. We like, we, we, we like what's in our control. We don't want to go beyond the boundaries, as, as Bonhoeffer says. Uh, we, we like to keep it within the realm of what we can control. We like to lord over everything. We like to exploit things. We're interested in what works for us, what makes money, what makes our life a little better, a little more convenient, what can pay the bills, what can pay the mortgage, what can help fix the car. Uh, and, and see, what, ta- what happens is I think the practical reasoning, the practical understanding starts to drown out this wonderful, wonder-filled understanding. And we lose it. We destroy mystery, Bonhoeffer says, by staying in our boundaries, the world of calculation and exploitation. So we lose that sense of awe and mystery over ourselves, he says, and over others and over the world and over the Christmas story. It's all familiar. So we live life on the surface. On the surface, and we miss the details. The details, the unique, the, the, the new, uh, the beautiful. No, we, we just live on the surface about what we can use, what furthers us. We get tired, we get bored. We live life one step removed. In some ways, see, we live in our already know. We, we have an already know. And so life begins to strike us the way, it, it, the way it hits you when you're listening to Grandpa tell the same story for the 40th time. You know, and you've heard it before out of politeness. You'll maybe stay there, but you've heard it before. And so it no longer holds your interest. And, and so part of you is checked out. It's the same old, same old. I already know that. Grandpa telling the story. And we view life like that. You look in the mirror, it's the same old story. <laughs> you know, the same old story. You've been married for how many years? Same old story. You know, you already know it. You stop looking because it no longer captures your interest. Uh, you look at a tree, it's the same old tree. The clouds are the same old clouds. The dog's the same old dog. The street's the same old street. The house is the same old house. The stars are the same old stars. The sun's the same old sun. Uh, and the Christmas story is the same old Christmas story. Heard it before, all familiar, already know it. No longer holds our interest. The, uh, the, today is my uh, 2000, I've been, I know, I, I've been alive 20,269 20, days. 20,269 days. 
I've seen this that many times. What's it gonna, well, what new things are gonna offer me? 20,269, I, I gave the wrong number last, last service. I did it in my head and it was totally wrong. Someone corrected me. But see, all life begins to be like this. It, it, no longer, it, we're, we're finished, we're finished. We're finished looking at it as a, 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 for the newness of it. And it no longer amazes us. I think it's one of the reasons why we, we like movies so much. Because in movies you can see exciting stuff and drama and, and it gives the momentary illusion that something exciting is happening. It provides an escape from our mundane lives. This is why some people, I think, like gossip. One of us, they feel better the more they can make other people look small, but, but they like the juicy, the new. Oh, did you hear? Did you hear? Oh, no. and, and it gives a momentary buzz that allows us to escape the mundaneness of our repetitious lives. Oh, did you hear? Oh, juicy. Mm. I think one of the reasons why we watch the news, and I, Shelley and I are news junkies. We're always watching the news. It's part of our family ritual when we have supper. But part of it is, I think, is we're looking, is, there must be something on the globe that's interesting, something happened that's interesting, and we want to find out about it. It's good to get information, but you can't do anything about it. It's just, if, in fact, General Patton thought this is why we go to war. Why did we go to war? Because we're bored. And there's some truth to this. Uh, it, it, to create some kind of excitement, a diversion from our mundane lives. How do we recapture the eyes of a child? How can we regain the wonder of the Christmas story and the wonder of our lives? That's the question. Um, here's the thing. I believe that the answer to that important question is right in front of us right now. It's the Christmas story. It's found in the Christmas story. But, but we, we're going to have to... We're going to have to listen to it uh, and set aside our already know mindset and listen to it, try to listen to it as though we're hearing it for the first time, this Christmas story. The key to living as a child and living with wonder, I think, is found here. Um, here's the thing. It's a story about God becoming a human being, right? It's a story of God becoming this little baby. It's a story of the Almighty God coming into our domain, our existence, and the story of God coming down to our level. And the story of God becoming present to us. Present to us. And the story of, of God not just partially becoming present to us, as though he had, was one step removed, but rather, the Bible says, the fullness of God is in Christ. Colossians 2.9. God was fully present. He became fully present in the person of, of Christ. He dove into our existence, the Christmas story is telling us, and, and totally came down to our plane. His full attention was on us, if you will. And I want us to see that when God did that, he did it out of love, right? It, it manifests his perfect love. And when God did that, he was doing a new thing. And you'll see that that's an important point here in a moment because love is always new. It never gets old. It never, grows, it never grows dull. God did a new thing out of love. His love led him to do a new thing. The Bible says that the word was made flesh. The word became flesh. That means, look at the verb, that God wasn't always a human being. He wasn't eternally a human being. There's a point in time when God became a human being. He did a new thing, radically new thing. And in doing that, God took on a new experience. God, for the first time, was living life through a human being. And so it says this in Hebrews 4, a very interesting passage. The author says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, no, he, he empathizes with us because he's been tempted in every way, just as we are, only he didn't sin. So then let us then approach God's throne with confidence. Now, think about this. Um, we're encouraged to have confidence that God empathizes with us. Jesus Christ, God, a human, empathizes with us because he's been through what we go through. He's experienced it from our perspective. Um, that means that God, it was, there's a new thing that God brought on, on himself when he became a human being. And it's supposed to give us confidence that he really, he really does understand our temptations. Now, God, of course, is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. And so he knew the facts about our temptation. He, he, he knows that we're tempted. But only when he became a human being did he experience it as a human being. Uh, from the inside of, of, of human skin, as it were. God, out of love, did something radically new. Now, I know, I know, and some of you right now are thinking, oh, Boyd's, Boyd's playing with heresy here. He's on the precipice of heresy. Danger, danger, Will Robinson, heresy. Wait, look, at, because here's, here's the thing, and this is true, that in the church tradition, this is what's called classical theism, and, and here, oh, here's Boyd going to go on one of his little theological, uh, you know, journeys. 
I already heard that before. Familiar, familiar. So you're going to tune out. Don't tune out. Listen, can you, see, I, here's the thing. I know that sometimes when you're preaching, if you've been here for two or three years, I can start to sound like grandpa. <laughs> I, you know, you only have so many stories to go around. We only have so many sermons. And so there's points. And I don't, I don't worry about it. I get my life from Christ. I understand. It's okay. But, you know, there's times where you say, oh, here's boy going to go off on this little church and politics thing. Heard that before. Already know it. Oh, here's boy going to tell us about how he, the Christmas tree melted because he took too much masculine. Heard that story before. And here's boy. Love your enemy. Enemies, love your enemies, always talking about love your enemies, heard that before, and you kind of, you know, you may stay here out of politeness and listen to me, although sometimes people don't, but, you know, you're half removed. It's hard to stay in touch when you've heard it before, but I'm telling you, stay tuned with this, okay? This is uh, uh, God doing a new thing, okay? And, and so, uh, in the church tradition, there is this thing called classical theism, and the general view of God has been that um, well, God is timeless. God's up there in his zone, and he sees all the past, present, and future in one unchanging, eternally the same moment. Uh, uh, God sees the past, present, and future from all eternity. There's no change in God. Nothing ever affects God. I know he's eternally the same. He eternally sees. Now, the world isn't eternal, and so now you've got to answer the question, how could uh, God experience the world as eternal when the world's not eternal? Good luck explaining that one. I think it's utter incoherence, but I'm not going to dwell on that fact right now. But uh, that's the idea. God's frozen in this timeless now. It's called the immutability of God. And nothing, nothing really affects God. Um, it, it, nothing ever changes. It's not just that God's character is unchanging, which is true. God's character is unchanging. Perfect love. You can't improve on it. But his experience never changes. Because it's it, it, from all eternity, he's experiencing the one thing. So it's like staring at a photograph throughout all eternity. <laughs> uh, now, this God never experiences a new thing, and that's the dominant view of God throughout in, in the church theology throughout throughout all of history. Um, I, I I think that. Um, uh, I know the reasoning that led to it, and it's not from the Bible. You don't find this kind of view in the Bible. Uh, there's some philosophical reasoning. It goes back to Plato and before him, Parmenides, and they had some logical steps that led them to think that what is perfect is utterly unchanging. And I think it's bad philosophy. I see the mistakes, you know, as, as they're leading up to it. Um, so it's based on bad philosophical reasoning. I think it's unbiblical. But the, most, the worst criticism I would raise against it is that it's boring. It's boring. Well, look at it. How would you like to be God staring at a photograph throughout all eternity? It's frozen. Nothing new can ever happen. You know, God's, he's so perfect. Nothing, he can't ever have a new experience. I, I, see, I think that the worst hell I can imagine is one where you're eternally bored. Because I experience boredom as a form of pain. And, and, and so the worst hell would be boredom. And so I think if that was true about God, he would literally now, listen to me, be bored as hell. <laughs> he would be. Talk about seeing it before, already know that. All eternity is one thing. No, no, see, look at, the, folks, the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible, every page, it applies verbs to God, which means God moves, God's impacted. Every page, God is a dynamic God, an interactive God, a responsive God, a God who is impacted by what we do, and what we do impacts us. He's a God who moves with us throughout history. There's a give and take flow throughout history as God interacts with his people. Uh, he, he has emotions, he gets angry, then he has compassion, and he has sorrow, and he gets frustrated. Uh, and what we do, you know, affects his experience, it affects his plans, and as he changes his plans in response to us. This is a dynamic God. The God of the Bible isn't this frozen, immutable God. He's a living God. He's a God of, of perfect love. He's a God who's got personality. He's a God who's interactive, interpersonal. He's a God who's not at all boring because he's a God of love, and love isn't boring. You see, this is a God who is out of love, willing to do new things. He's always doing new things throughout the Bible. A God of love, who, who out of love, does radically new things, and, and it never gets old. And this is why this God reveals himself most perfectly when he does the most radically new thing. He becomes a little baby, which is what the Christmas story is all about. See, God is a God of love, and, and, and we see what love looks like when we look at the person of Jesus Christ. Here we see him perfectly revealed. And see, in doing that, God's revealing who he is, and he's revealing what love is, and he's revealing what love does. And what it reveals is that it's incarnational. It does new things, radically new things, takes risks, is adventurous, and is incarnational. He comes down, he reveals his love by coming down to our plane, becoming fully present to us. And then, and see, we've always thought of the incarnation. This is what's called the incarnation, when God is embodied as a human being. And we always see it as something that God did for us, which is absolutely true. But we rarely see it as something that we also are supposed to do. 
But it is. So Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, he says live in love. And I know I've said, given those verses a lot. I, this is my favorite verse. You've heard this verse before. If you come here uh, on a regular basis. Or, but, but don't do your already know. No, listen to it. It's got something new to teach. Be imitators of God, he says. And the word he uses there is, is mimitai. It means to mimic. We're supposed to mimic God. We have, we have Abba's character inside of us. And so we're supposed to mimic him. And what does it look like to mimic him? Well, it looks like living in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us. Do what Christ did. What did Christ do? He went beyond his boundaries, to use Bonhoeffer's language. Uh, he didn't stay at the surface. No, he, 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 went, he went deep. He entered into our experience. What did, what, what, did he, what did he do? He embodied himself on our plane. So also for us to live in love means we go beyond our, our boundaries and become present to others. As Christ has become present to us, we're to become present to others. As Christ showed his love by, by, by ascribing worth to us, by fully being there for us, coming down to our level, so also we are to live in a way where we become fully present to others. We're to be, if God is incarnational and we are his children, we are to be incarnational which means we embody ourselves in, in, in the, the, the experience of others, even taking their experience upon ourselves. Uh, you know, Bonhoeffer says this in his book, Ethics. Um, he says that love, love can never be general. You can't love in general. You can't love in the abstract. You can't love theoretically. Love is always concrete. It's always now. It's always, it's always personal, which means love to be... Ex- to express love, you can only do it to this person here and now and to this person here and now. It's always incarnational. It's not theoretical and abstract, which is why love is always new. Because every moment, if, if, if love is always about right here and now being fully present to another, then love is always new because every moment is new. Think about it. This moment right now, it never happened before in the history of the universe and it never will happen again. And now this moment, it never happened before, and it never will happen again. There's a novelty to each moment. That's, that's the only reason why we can distinguish it from the present moment. <laughs> there's, there's, new, there's a newness there. There's a novelty. In the, now, there's a lot of continuity, too. That's what keeps the world stable. But the newness is what, what, what moves the world forward. And that's where the beauty is. That's where the mystery is. That's where the hidden qualities are. But we miss it all if we get bored by the continuity. We miss it all if, if the repetition and the familiar just puts us to sleep. Love is, is present in the now and every now is new. That's why God in the Bible is always the God who's doing the new. He's the opposite of this frozen God. His, his mercies are new every morning. He makes all things new. There's a newness to God, a freshness to God. That's why heaven will never be boring. Never. No, it's always new. It's always fresh because it's always love. Love never grows old. The wonder, when we live incarnationally and we become present to others and, and, and stop doing our already know and... and uh, Open our eyes wide like a child does. Well, now we start to get in touch with the wonder-filled dimension that is around us all the time. When, when we're no longer finished with the world, but we, start, we, we, we continue to go beneath the surface and see the hidden boundaries and, and, and we live in love, that's when we get in touch with that wonder-filled dimension of life again. We become as little children. So Bonhoeffer says this. Listen to this. This is just a profound quote. The final depth of all mystery, he says, is when two people come so close to each other that they love each other. Nowhere in the world does one feel the might of the mysterious and its wonder as strongly as here. Knowledge about each other, when when you're living in love, does not remove the mystery, but makes it more profound. See, that's that wonder-filled understanding. It's not practical understanding that removes the mystery. No, the love... The more you know, the more profound is the mystery. So it's a little bit like this. Here's what I think he's getting at. Several weeks ago, Shelly and I are uh, downstairs in the kitchen, and we're making a salad. Uh, and that's probably about the most mundane, boring thing you can imagine, because we have a salad five days a week. We want you say about five, four or five days a week. It's what we do. We're vegetarians, so we're always having salads. And um, uh, it's amazing. We always like them. We never, it never you know, really gets uh, too familiar to us. So we're down in the kitchen, and, and we're making the lettuce, you're putting the lettuce in the bowl, and I get my artichokes. I like artichokes. Shelly doesn't, though. So I have artichokes on mine and get some uh, uh, black uh, olives on mine. She doesn't like black olives. But we, we both like to have cucumbers and tomatoes, and I'm really boring the heck out of you right now, but that's on purpose. <laughs> Because I, I, I want you to know this was very boring. This is a boring thing. I, I'm very, we do this all the time, so I'm very familiar with it. I already know this. I already know this scene. Nothing new here. 
right? And since, I, you know, it, it's, it's all, I've already done this, it's all familiar, um, it no longer is holding my interest, so my brain then is going to something which is more interesting, which is the last paragraph I wrote, or some theological problem, or some atonement issue, who knows? But it's not there. I, I, most of life you can do on autopilot. Uh, and then for whatever reason, I woke up. I woke up. I, I, I remember, and it was all the grace of God who was, I think, always calling us, Abba's children, to live incarnationally. It's just that we're good at tuning him out. But I woke up, and, and I remembered that I'm supposed to live in the present moment, that, that the now is all that's real. It's the only thing that's real. And I remembered that, that um, I'm supposed to remember that God's presence is around us, you know, and, and I'm supposed to live in love, which is, means to live incarnationally. I'm supposed to be there. I keep my eyes open. And so as I, I start to look at now the, the, the scene that we're in, this very ordinary, mundane, boring scene that we're in, that I've done a thousand, a thousand plus thousands of times, uh, and I'm looking at it now with fresh eyes, uh, as I'm aware of, of, of God's presence, and I'm aware of the newness of this moment, I look at Shelley as though I'm looking at it for the first time. I, I'm no longer looking at the already know, you know, that's how we usually look at, at folks, I already know, I already got that, I know that story, but rather, I, I, I know the Shelley I've been married to for 33 years, but this Shelley in this moment is different, okay, this is, this is the Shelley in this moment, and it's utterly unique, and utterly precious, and utterly sacred, it never has happened before, and never will happen again, and the most ordinary moment becomes sacred when, when, we, we, when we're aware of God's presence, and we stay awake. And, and now you begin to see past the surface and see the hidden qualities of things. Because your eyes are open. And so I, I noticed this charming, I don't know if you remember me saying it, but the charming way she's, she's peeling the cucumber. It's like, I, 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 there's a beauty I begin to see it in the way she's just peeling the cucumber and a cuteness in the way she's just kind of doing her salad. Never quite saw it like that before. And there's a joy that comes when you see the hidden qualities of things. And I wake up. Become aware that, that we are here in this kitchen making a salad with my artichoke and black olives and, and, and the cucumber and the tomatoes. And, and we're doing it in the heart of God. We're doing it uh, as, as an expression of God's love. It, I'm aware of God's love. It's God's love that sustains us here. The mystery of God's love that creates us. The mystery of God's love that gives us the cucumber. The mystery of God's love that gives us each other and gives us a love for one another. It's the mystery of God's love that allows us to then go in and, 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 and watch the news uh, as we're eating our, our, our cucumber. And, and it's, it's, it's an expression of God's the mystery of God's love that we're going to grow old together. You see, it's all, it's all there. And we're, we're in the presence of God. And that makes it sacred and it's always new and it never gets old. If only our eyes will stay open. And now, now there's an awe, there's a wonder. The eternal God is, is, is holding us in being right this moment. And I, I am, see, I believe that as I'm awake in this most mundane of all activities, that, that I am understanding and participating in the mystery of God, which is Jesus Christ. Because see, it's the same love that led God to become incarnate as a baby and become fully present to us is now leading me to incarnate myself in this moment and become fully present to Shelley. You see? And that's what love always does. And it's always new. The way it looks this moment is different than the way I looked the previous moment. Uh, and that's where the joy is. The, joy, the wonder is when you are now understanding and participating in that which you can never comprehend. And the more you understand it, the more beautiful it is because the more mysterious it is. The unfathomable, beautiful love of God that surrounds us moment by moment and invites us to participate in it moment by moment. The incarnation is not just something that God did for us. It's something that we are to be replicating in our own life. And it's always here and it's always now. And it's always new. So I encourage us as we are going. See, this is, this is what children have. Children, as my kids, as they're dancing, you see it in their eyes. They're there. Their minds are not yet, they're not one step removed from reality because they're bored with it. And they're not one step removed because their minds are polluted with worries and concerns like ours tend to be. So we have to have a choice, make an effort to get to where they are naturally until they lose their innocence. And we do that through the incarnation. And so I encourage us as we go into this season, we're already in it, but then as we go into the next year, um, to not, don't just look at your spouse and look at your children or your grandchildren or look at your parents or look at your friends, but look into them. 
Look into them. And be mindful that this is taking place because of the love of God. And the love of God is inviting you to participate in it. In that now, by being fully present there. Mindful. And as you do, then you'll notice the hidden details, the hidden qualities, the beauty of the mystery that you otherwise would miss. Our, our boredom, the repetition, and our, our, our already know, it, it gives us cataracts that prevents us from seeing the mystery all around us. Let's be incarnational people as we go throughout this season. Hear the story, the Christmas story, as though you're hanging for the first time. Watch your children or your loved ones, your spouse, as though for the first time. Be present there. It's a challenge. It's the simplest thing in, in, in the world to do, but it's also the most challenging thing because I guarantee you that before you leave the church, you'll have forgotten it. You'll, we, we fall back. There's this gravity that pulls us in the direction of the mundane, uh, and, and we lose our awareness. King of people, by the power of God, let's stay awake. Stay awake with wide open eyes like children surrounded by mystery. And behold the beauty and participate in the mystery. Okay, we got time for one question, I believe. One, one, one question. Where was God during the shootings on Friday? Yeah, ooh, yes. Um, that's the question everyone is asking. Um, let, let, me, let me say this. That, that, you know, there's a, uh, we, we watched on the news last night. <laughs> Uh, when one of the parents, maybe some of you saw this, uh, one of the parents of a child who was uh, killed, I, my, my heart just broke for this guy listening to him talk. But he was asked if he was mad at God uh, for this happening. His answer was just beautiful. Because in, in the course of answering, he said, no, I'm not mad at God. Um, God, because God, his aim is love, he gave us, he made free agents, he said. So this guy, father said, he made free agents, and, and because of that, we can use it to benefit or to harm. And this man chose to use his free agency for the purposes of harm. But that's not on God. That's on him. It's not on God. And I just, I thought, I was, it was so refreshing to hear that. Amen. I, I just think it's... Um, they, uh, it, because all, most often in the face of tragedies, what happens is that's when people fall into these cliches about how God knows what he is doing, you know, and, and, and God, somehow this is all part of a great plan, and, and so on and so on. It's so refreshing to hear someone who gave what I think is a much more biblical perspective. Where was God? You know, God was crying. Uh, God was down there hugging those kids, and uh, God was doing everything he could given the kind of world he created, to minimize the evil and maximize the good. God's always working. He's always good. He always looks like Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and see, the thing is, people say, well, gosh, but then you don't think God's all powerful. Because doesn't have God, God has the power to stop it if he wanted to, doesn't he? But see, it's not about the power. I, I talk about this in, in uh, Is God to Blame and God at War and some, some other books out there. But it's not about the power. It's about the kind of world that God decided to create. Is it a world where he's going to have unilateral say-so, in which case we would all be you know, just expressions of his say-so. We'd all be automatons. Or is it a world where he's going to pull back some of his unilateral say-so in order to give us some say-so and angels some say-so? So we have free agency. And see, if he decides to create that kind of world, and I think that's the world he did create, then that means that he can't just interfere whenever he wants to. If he gives me the power to go this way to that degree or that way to that degree, good or evil, then if I start going down this path that he doesn't like, he can't withdraw that. Because if he did, it would mean that he didn't really give me the power to go this way or that way. The definition of giving me the power to go this way or that way is that he's got to allow me to go that way if I'm going to go down that way. Because if he withdraws it, it just means he didn't give me the power to go this way or that way. It's no different than if God, God decides to create a triangle, it can't be a circle. If God decides to create an aardvark, it can't be an elephant. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's about what kind of world did God decide to create. And so this kind of a world is a world where there's a risk of pain. There's a risk of evil. There is, there's going to be pain. Um, and, but the promise of God is that it's worth it. Now, God cries... God's love outruns our love by an infinity, and so God's sorrow is greater than, than ours is. So and the, that's what the cross expresses, right? The cross expresses the heart of God in the face of evil. But the, the good news is that his promise is that 
uh, he is able he, he, in, to win in the end, and he will uh, uh, bring good out of evil, and he, they, the end will be infinitely worth it. It will be incomparably worth it. it. He won't just break even on this by saying it will be worth it. No, Paul says it's incomparably worth it. The glory that God has in store for us, it can't be compared to the sufferings that we go through now. And that just means that heaven's got to be mind-boggling beautiful. It's got to be mind-boggling beautiful. Amen. And that, knowing that, it should make us yearn for him to return. Lord, come and restore this world, redeem this world, eradicate evil. And someday, the, 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 it will, I don't, we don't have to know how, you work it out, how, how he'll work out the details. I, I have gotten a word that's helped me so much, and I've got to close with this, but a word uh, in prayer 20 years ago, I guess it was, because the suffering of kids has always been the thing that knocks me out the worst. And my own issues can get involved in that. But... See, I, the, the word I got from God, it was about children at Auschwitz, actually, in the Holocaust. And I got a picture of Jesus with these kids, uh, you know, with, with the concentration camp numbers on them. And his word to me was, and this was Jesus talking to me, I'm telling you. He, he just looked at me with his eyes of love and compassion. He says, Greg, trust me, I can, I'll make it up to the children. I'll make it up to the children. And I don't know what the implications of that is, but I will lean on that. Uh, uh, the, the, the story for these kids doesn't end at the age of five, and that's it. No, no. God, God, God it's a long story. It's not a short story. Amen. It's, it's going to be a beautiful story. It's going to be an incredibly glorious story. It will, in the end, be the most beautiful story ever told. The eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, and neither has it ever entered in the imagination of a human being what God has in store for those who love him. And so have your hope on Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what uh, gives us courage to move, move through with stuff like this. All right, I like to, I'm going to close in prayer to, for the Holy Spirit to seal this message on our hearts. And as I do, I'd like to ask the prayer teams to come forward. And if you're here and have any need whatsoever, I encourage you to come and, and pray with these folks. Don't carry that burden out on your own. They would love to pray with you. Yeah. Abba, fathers, we leave, leave here. Uh, God, we thank you for being an incarnational God who stepped into our realm, became fully present to us, and remains fully present to us. As we leave here, God, will you seal this on our hearts to be incarnational, to be present to show, and, and the way we look at folks, that we're there. We ascribe worth by our presence to them. Help us to stay mindful that we are always swimming in the beautiful, myst mysterious love uh, that's revealed on, on, on Calvary. Uh, help us to stay awake and love as you loved. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Go out and love on the world. Stay present. Stay awake. <laughs>